Anne Queen Gantis here, your host for Behind the Pen. I hope everyone is well today. I am an award-winning author of 14 books. I'm an award-winning filmmaker, a podcaster, YouTuber, booktuber. I run Author Assist, which helps authors with their marketing and promotion. And I'm also the host of the Artist First Radio Network radio show, Author Assist. Now, you know by now that Behind the Pen is a show for the creatives, for those that use the pen. So they, my guests can be an artist, a writer, a musician, editor, director, tattooist, anyone who uses a pen. So today my guest is Mickey Westcott. Welcome to the show, Mickey. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here as well. So whereabouts are you in this big old world? I am in the USA, uh, Colorado. And I'm on the island of Corfu in Greece. <laughs> nice. Total international show. There we go. Yes. It's good the the internet. It's amazing what the internet does. It can bring people together from all over the world. Yes, it's beautiful. It's fabulous, isn't it? So I think it's the best thing ever invented. Also, there's a downside, of course, to the internet, but we don't think about that. You have to think of the positive of everything in life, you know. So, as I've just said, it's all to do about creators that use a pen. So the first question I ask my guest is. What do you use your pen for, Mickey? Well, um, at this time, I uh, written a book about foster care. Mm -hmm. um, right, foster care process and tips for newbies, and it's just what to expect, how to start the whole process. Okay, so so you're a writer, stroke author. What about back? back way back when you were younger what were your hidden talents what did you what were you good at when it came to creativity and art um well i've always loved um pictures i've always loved photos um just drawing things like that i'm not that great at drawing but i still loved it you know yeah it's relaxing isn't it when you get a hold yeah. of a sketch pad sketch pad and a pencil and and there's nothing on it and then you start drawing and you're creating something either from um, looking at it straight on or from your imagination. And uh, art is, I think all aspects of art is very therapeutic. So what were you like at school when it came to creative writing? Um, you know, I really wasn't that great. I, I guess I really didn't take to it. Um, once I got into college, you know, I, I started getting a little more creative in that way. But I don't think it was more of a writing thing per se for me. It was more of, um, I used to draw my, my dream home mm. or I used to, you know, I took architecture in school and things like that. So um, creative memories, you know, with the photos and the family and, and I was very family family oriented. I just wanted a home. I wanted a family. I wanted kids, you know, that type of a Yeah. Um, going back to, to your, your book, um, I'm assuming that the only reason you became a writer, um, uh, which is a nonfiction anyway, your book is because of a situation that you've either faced yourself or something that uh, you work in that uh, environment. Exactly. exactly. Which one? Which one is it? I would say um, because of experiences and because of everything that um, has come um, in my life and, and the things that I've done. Yeah. So, so I assume that you found out that you were a foster child. No, I was not a foster child. Ah. My mother was. Oh, right. Thinking back, everything has come full circle for our family history. And growing up, my uh, mother and all of her five siblings were actually in uh, at that time, because it was so long ago in the 30s, they were in orphanages. Wow. And they would separate the girls and the boys. And so her and her sister were in uh, an orphanage. And at that time, when you got to be 16 years old, you mm -hmm. had to be paired up with a family. Mm -hmm. And so families in the city, in the town would take in the teens, but it wouldn't necessarily be foster care, quote, like we know it. 
it would be working kids. So they they would go into the home and they would work for the family. And if it didn't work out, then they'd send the kid back to the orphanage. And in my mother's case, it did not work out because as we know, when teens get to be teens, you know, their hormones go, everything is just, you know, they want to do what they want to do and they get rebellious if they haven't been already a little rebellious. Well, she was one of the rebellious ones and she they got couldn't cope back. with her, so they sent her back. Right. I mean, back then, the orphanages, uh, it's like we've seen them on the TVs, we've seen them in the films, that they, they, mm. they were portrayed quite... Um, quite correctly in 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 the films and everything of how bad it was to live in those places how bad yes. the kids were treated the regimental orders get up at a certain time eat a certain way don't speak while you're eating uh, you know when you think of Oliver Twist and it's not far not really far-fetched to how these orphanages were run so very um, true you I'm sure were either asking your mum or doing the research for her, um, what was the reason that all of the kids, all of the family were put in the orphanage? Did, um, did was it abandonment? Was it a, a death? I mean? A lot of the times it was a death. Um, in my mother's case, her mother uh, was in an accident and died when she was maybe three. Um, oh. And so he, her father could not take care of all the children. And so it was a thing to basically um, make sure that the orphanages were there. So they took the children and he actually paid. Um, so to, he didn't even take one child. He just put them all straight in the orphanage, but he paid for them to go in. They, uh, that's what I was told that he had to actually pay. And it was like a community at that time because the younger, her younger brother was only one years old. So he went to live with uh, his grandmother, the grandmother. Oh, right. Okay. And Stay so the, the grandmother would actually, there would be card games for the women in the neighborhood and they would actually go to the orphanage once a week and they would play and they knew, they knew the nuns. Um, you know, not on a great basis, but it was the, I guess, community area that they would go to. So they would see their grandmother. They would see their father very periodically, you know. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it was a real different situation. Yeah, real different. He, I mean, did he, did he remarry at all, your grandfather? Not that I know of. So it, it's just, he couldn't afford to, to keep the kids, couldn't afford to look after them. Right. And a lot of times it seems back then there was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of, I, I wouldn't per se drug, but I would say drinking. It was acceptable. And so you have men who are working in the industry. You have, you know, trying to do these things and they, they're drinkers. You know, I mean, you have all these kids that he couldn't take care of the kids, you know. No. And so, yeah, just real, real different dynamic than it is than we would think about now and how. Most, most definitely. Uh, when it came to the families putting the kids to work, I mean, were they shoved in the coal mines? Were they told to go to the laundry or were they put to work inside the house? Inside the house inside the house they, they you learn to clean house, you learn um, to cook with the children mm. yes yes now especially the girls now i'm not sure about the boys i can't I'm not see sure them about doing the boys, yeah that. especially especially in that day and age i mean it hasn't changed that much now but especially in that yeah. day and age a boy behind the kitchen sink i don't think so so yeah so i'm sure that they did labor and they were with the men you know just the roles that was it the same as it is now where they actually got paid to take the kids in. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. so. I don't think so because they were there um, to do the work around the house. If they didn't, I know that if they didn't match with the family, if, if it didn't work out, then no, they so were good. in contact with the orphanage and then they sent them right back. So I don't know if they send another kid to work, you know, that type of thing. So... 
I, I don't know those details. So basically, when you, you, you've got uh, a family and they've got two of their own kids and they've, they've got a, a small house and they're like, oh, let's go and get a kid from the orphanage to clean up and start cooking and they use them as a slave and make them do everything that we don't want to do. And right. that was and allowed. Yes. And you'd think, OK, well, let's try to look at it from their point of view, maybe. OK, I do have a family. I have a home. I'm going to try to, you know, maybe give a kid a chance. You know, let's bring a teen in. Let's this, let's that. But I, it just, in my view, yeah. I may be wrong. But no, I hear you. It was maybe not so much love there. There was, yeah. and, and you're not thinking about the trauma that those kids went through. Yeah. And yeah, that's the last that... thing. I think if they if they're a couple and they can't have kids, then maybe that team would be in a, a lucky one and be in a good family and be treated well and loved and respected and be part of the family. But if they've taken the kid for the simple reason of mm -hmm. wanting them to work and do the jobs they don't want to do around the house, then yeah, they, it's obvious they won't get that uh, love that they want, they needed. So your mum was sent back to the orphanage. I mean, how many times did that happen until she finally, what was she, was she kicked out? Did she go to a nunnery? I mean, what do they do when they get to the age of like 18 and they're too right, old they, to be fostered? Right. I think she might have went to another home. Um, and then at that point, um, I don't think that worked out either from my recollection. And then she aged out. So basically they'll give you a little bit of money and hit the road. So they do, <laughs> so, they kick you off, kick you out and you're on your much. own. Thank God. Thank God that she did have an older sister who actually went through the same thing. So she did her, her stint in a home and then she was on her own. So she was in school or she worked. They just basically went right to work. They got a job afterwards. And then well, they met where... up. They were they were able to meet up the two sisters. They met. Up oh again. yeah, they came. They were together in the orphanage. And incidentally, I found out that um, my mother's cousin was also in the north in the orphanage. So she came into care as well because I think her mother passed. Mm. So they looked so much alike that everybody was like, you know, you're your cousin is here, your family member is here. And so what they did was they switched. They would go somewhere during the summer and another group would stay. And then they would switch back and forth. So my mother was in one group, her cousin was in another. And when they switched back and forth, you know, the people would say, oh, you have a twin, you know, that type of thing. And then they found out about each other. And then, you know, that's how they knew. But afterwards, they would just basically go work, you know. Um, and, uh, was it? I, I'm hoping now that it was a good job, and not being forced into prostitution or yes, slavery or whatever. Thank God for that. They um, ended up working as secretaries and managers. Oh and, wow! And my mother ended up being um, a, a secretary and assistant. And even from the time that I was born and on until she retired and passed, she, she became uh, an executive secretary for the school district where we live. So wow. I mean, she really made something of her life. Um, and thank God for that, because then we come along and, you know, she was able to really make something. And it could have been, it could have been a very different scenario. It, it certainly could, you know, there are, there are nicer stories that uh, like a Jane Eyre and then and end up with a nice uh, happy after, ha happily ever after. Um, but there are those that are on the streets that don't find work and are forced to go into um, areas like that just so they can live. I mean, if you can yeah. call that living anyway, I don't know. But um, so, yeah, I think your mum was very lucky at that time and for, for her to get a good job and then what, um, get married and have the babe have you and I mean are you how many siblings do you have um I have with my mother I have one sister um my father has had other kids yeah before they, so we, they got married so you had stepsisters yes. or stepbrothers yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah wow so we basically me and my sister um with my mother and so she provided, she provided a great, great home. So everything came full circle. 
And yeah. I didn't even realize it until yeah. years, years later when I started foster care. Yeah. So, so let, I mean, we're going, getting closer to the book now um, because you, you just said that you started foster care. So was you're married um, and whether you, you, you're on your own or you wanted a child or you were married and you couldn't have children. What was the reason for you to foster? I think when I got older, I always wanted to do something that would make a difference. Mm. I wanted to do actually Peace Corps and just travel, ah. and that type of thing, but it, it never really came, came about. Um, but always in my heart, I just wanted a family. I wanted a home, you know, the whole thing, picket fence, just the yeah. family, you know. And um, when I got older, obviously I did my thing in college. And, um, but I, a friend and a friend's family opened a foster care agency. And so kind of found out more about it and what was happening and the whole process. So I decided, you know, and by that time I had, Two children. Oh, you've had, you've um, got two children. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I have two biological children and uh, two adopted children now. Mm. So by that time I had two children and so I decided to do foster care. Yeah. And I mean, this is something you've always had in your heart, especially learning about your mum's situation. How did your husband feel when you turned around and said, oh, how do you feel about getting another kid in the house? <laughs> right. So in the beginning, I was not married. I was not married. Um, uh, after I started doing foster care by my on my own, um, and then my children's father um, came back in the picture. And so, so you were a single mother, and then you fostered as a single mother, and then the biological father came back into the picture wow mm -hmm. that's that you don't hear yes. that very often yes so then um he did he came back in the picture uh obviously i i had a couple kids between them and mm -hmm. then um i did have a child when he came back in the picture and he supported he supported nicely yeah. and, and so you fostered two children and you adopted both of them or you or was it different kids that you adopted was it your foster children that you adopted yes oh. and and what what are they uh, boys girls what were their names um a girl who who is now 28 years old mm -hmm. um i adopted her fostered her uh for a year and i adopted her at 12. she was 12. Um, Mm -hmm. oh. And I was also fostering her brother. So there's five siblings all together in her family. And I fostered. Oh, you kept them together. Well, I fostered her brothers first for about two and a half years. And then, uh, you know, the whatever the situation was between the five, they separated. And then she came to be with us. And then the boys had to move, um, which is a whole story in itself, too. Um, but the boys had to move and she stayed. She wanted to stay. And she, when they're 12 years old and older, they have a say of who yeah. and what happens in their life. So she wanted to stay and we adopted her. Aww. And then my son, who just turned 18 yesterday, oh. he is um, uh, 18 and I uh, fostered and picked him up at the hospital at three days old. So he was... Uh, <sighs> Actually, he was born on the 3rd and I picked him up on the 5th of May. And so- Oh my gosh, so you've had him like from the baby. He's, yep. he's been okay. your, he's been your and baby called, and now he's just 18. Oh, that's so 18. beautiful. And he, um, when they called me for him that week, they were calling for babies. It was like a baby boom that week for some reason. Everyone and just said babies. Got, it was Did she abandon the baby, the mother? Calls. I'm sorry? Did she abandon the baby, the mother? No, she was um, she was drug positive yeah. at birth and she didn't really have any prenatal care, that type of thing. So when uh, he was positive, then they stepped in. Yeah. 
So then they asked me to pick them up. So after four phone calls of saying, no, I don't think that's going to be a match. No, I won't take him or her. They called me for my son. And I knew right then and there, I said yes right away. And I knew he was mine. I knew Aww. in here, I knew in my heart he was mine. And did, within a year, we finalized. I mean, did he have, has he had any problems, especially as a, a child and a toddler, um, health problems caused from um no i do see a lot of times you will deal with you know a lot of issues you know um failure to thrive you have developmental delays you have Mm. all of that stuff and he he experienced none of that wow Um, he was he had a lot of prayer behind him and um i knew from that moment that i said yes he was not going to have any issues. And so, <laughs> so he didn't have any delays, anything, any problems, no withdrawals, oh, that's nothing. Fabulous news. But yeah. you were ready to accept it and get on with it no matter what. You knew taking the child that there might have been problems and you were ready to accept that. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, happy birthday to him. What a beautiful yes. story. So let's get i mean you haven't done a fiction book about your life a memoir yet that could come next but you've done a non-fiction book about the process of fostering um is this in uh, your experiences and research you've done or is this going from how it used to be to how it is now i mean are you talking about everything how are you how's the book uh, written well I go through the process of um, what do you do when you want to start? What to expect? What do you do? Um, And that's pretty much the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, each state has their own laws and their own process. So you have to kind of go with the flow with that. Um, But for the most part, um, I just go through what that process is. What do you do first? What do you do next? What should you expect? Um, hey, what to look for, and then I, what to look for as far as um, really knowing, like from my experience, um, what's the best practices, that type of thing. Yeah, and it's a lot. It's a very it's it's questions that has seemed to come up very often when people mm-hmm. want to know. So I just kind of go through the process. Because yeah. I mean, you you went from um, taking the baby and taking a. 12 year old so you've done both the ages so your experience when it comes to saying well this is what you do when you uh, foster a baby this is how you need to uh, when someone's older a baby I mean they don't know anything they don't know you it doesn't matter you're starting from scratch basically yeah but when they're older and they're suddenly in a strange house that there's a way you have to be with them. There's a temperament. There's there's a way that you speak with them. There's a way that you treat them. You know, you make them feel comfortable. You make them feel welcome. You make them feel loved. You make sure they're not scared. You know that they know mm-hmm. they're not alone. That you'll always be there for them if they have nightmares. If they need you anytime, you know, uh, and because you've experienced both like i said both ages you were able to to put all that in in the book i mean no research needed for that part really because it's hands-on um what was it like to to take uh, your daughter um when you fostered before you actually adopted her um well remember i had her brothers and mm-hmm. her brothers were seven and nine Mm. Um, so I had them for a period of time. So we got to know her a little bit and the other siblings because they were oh. siblings. Oh, They're, wonderful. Yes. So, so they all always... they, they were together. They all um they weren't separated and, and you know they oh that's wonderful. Separated by homes, but not separated but... because um social service was would always make sure that the biological parents would have visits. You'd have visits, depending on the situation, you could have visits one or two times a week. Mm. So we were on that that consistent schedule. So Mm. I got to know um, the mother, the grandmother, maybe even the uncle and the aunt showed up in the visit. So I, we got to know the older, my daughter that I adopted, two younger little girls, they were babies, and then the boys, her brothers that I had. So we, we did this for about 
a year, year and a half, two years. So we we got to know them. So at the point where the homes where the other children were, it didn't work out, or the social services and the social workers knew that it was going to go to adoption. It was going to end up going to adoption and terminating the parents' rights. So they found another adoption adoptive home for the girls, mm-hmm. and they didn't want the older daughter. So and I had the boys, so I let. And we approved that the older daughter could come with me. So we had, I had the three of them and then the other little two went to an adoptive home. So it it was progressing, case was progressing. And so uh, when she came, I already knew her. My daughter knew her. My daughter is basically almost a year older than her. Mm. So they connected, they were Mm. like two. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. I think it makes it easier for the child um, when they come into a foster home for someone their age to be yes. there, you know, that they yes. can relate to, that they can just um, yeah. shout out to and and and, and play and, only, and have hobbies and what have you. Yes, exactly. And not only that, they learn the rules and they learn the lay of the land better because they watch is what they do in the beginning, the honeymoon period. They watch the other children. They watch how they interact with me, with parent. They watch how what the rules of the house are how what not to do what to do what not to say what to say and they they're very watchful i mean they have they had to learn how to be so um i mean even even there and then they their personality comes out and then the rebellion once they feel comfortable and then you get to know yeah Yeah. you get to know the cheeky little girl behind the the shyness Uh (laughs) um we were talking before about how bad the orphanages were. I mean, we still hear nowadays how bad foster homes can be for kids. Yeah. Um, so I think it can be quite scary when they're moved from one to another, uh, mm-hmm. especially oh, yeah. the females, especially the females. Um, so, it, but, but you took her when you wasn't uh, with, the, you took her when you were single. So No, we were, I was no. married by then. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, I was married by then. Mm-hmm. Now, right. incidentally, she was 11 or 12, but she had been in and out of foster homes since she was four years old. Wow. And she was the oldest in the family. And then her mother started having, you know, babies. So as that time went on, they were all kind of in and out of foster homes. So at that time, I think she had been in, she had a I'm going to roughly experience. say five homes. Yeah. A lot of experience. And I can't guarantee, I can't say i would say 100 percent. not all of them would have been uh perfect family homes and mm-hmm. that's probably why that she was moved so often as well i think she's yeah. lucky that she found you and you're lucky that you found yeah. her i think that's a a beautiful ending to to a a, a terrible start in life and and yeah. like i said with your son that he's he was lucky to to start from scratch you know yes, thank like you the, i appreciate that yeah to start from scratch and uh to to have your your son and and to grow up and toddler and tantrums and then teens and then oh yeah beautiful absolutely beautiful <laughs> so um how long has your book been out for now uh it's been maybe about a month or so just oh right so you're a newbie you're a newbie author yes. oh, yeah. lovely debut writer congratulations so this book is for people that uh, are thinking about fostering or people that are fostering or people in the system. I mean, what? who are your readers for this book? Um, I would say people that are thinking about fostering, but even if you are fostering already, there's a lot of good information that I put in there um, mm-hmm. that some people, even if they're fostering, are not aware of um, mm-hmm. and just good best practices and tips you know, what to look Brilliant. for, maybe what not to do on certain situations, you know, that type of thing. And is it most of it is from your experience or did you have to do a lot of research as well? Um, most of it from experience and um, uh, just letting people know also that not every case is going to go book picture book wise. And it's, it is through experience and you, you will not be able to, how do I say this? 
you have to experience the experience. Yeah, you know? whether it's a good oh, one or a bad mature. one, that's how you grow, that's how you learn, right. yes. yes. Yeah, so I hear from you on experience, that. Yeah, it, it's pretty fundamental in, in, in how it's set up. You know, this happens first, this happens second, this happens third, mm. but in those chapters, I go into a lot of tips and things that you should do and maybe questions you should ask um Brilliant. things like that and be careful Excellent. of this be careful of that you know things like that so where can uh, people find your book uh, mickey it is available on amazon um and you um yeah so every anybody can get it <laughs> just just on amazon it's yes, uh, right ebook now. and paperback yes so is it on kindle limited for those that are on ku um no not yet mm. I'm just wondering why you've just oh, yeah. gone with Amazon. You, you're missing a big marketplace out there if you don't yeah, go so wide. I need to, yeah, I need yeah to we're, we're going to have a chat, I think. After. Yeah, we'll have a chat later. Okay, where can people find you on social media if they have any questions and they want to reach out to you? Sure, sure. Uh, my page is my name, Mickey Westcott. Um, and I have um, Instagram lead to the number two, hope, lead to hope. And I also have another page on Facebook, um, The Hope Coach. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on Behind the Pen. It's been, it's been wonderful chatting with you and uh, wish you lots of success with the book and uh, with um, your life and with your children. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.